So I thank the organizers for allowing me to present the aspect you know, from the, of guidelines from the American point of view. And I also uh, had the privilege, like Dr. Yoshino, to be part of the ESMO consensus panel uh, that uh, Dr. Van Kutzum just presented. And I do believe that NCCN and ESMO guidelines are very complementary, but they focus a little bit on different things. So NCCN guidelines are quite widely used and widely established. I just want to give you some background on what NCCN actually is and how we come to our consensus recommendations. So NCCN stands for the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. It's a U.S.-based alliance of these 27 cancer centers in a nonprofit organization founded in 1995 to advance quality and effectiveness and efficiency of cancer care. And uh, the published guidelines for that includes diagnosis, monitoring, treatment, and surveillance of patients with cancer in various indications actually routinely serve in this very important as compendia for reimbursement of diagnostic tests and cancer therapies, not just by private payers, but also by Medicare in the United States. So NCCN guidelines have direct implication of reimbursement of cancer therapies and diagnostic tests in, in the United States. So the uh, NCCN members are probably quite well known. Mayo Clinic uh, centers, MD Anderson, Dana Faba, Moffitt, uh, uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, other major cancer centers in the United States are all um, a member of NCCN. So the NCCN Colorectal Cancer Committee uh, cons uh, is consistent of 32 members which are appointed by the membership institutions. We have a mix of medical oncology, radiation oncology, surgeons, gastroenterologists, interventional radiology, pathology, and importantly, patient advocates on the panel. And uh, the panel actually reviews guidelines and proposes changes four times a year by a teleconference for every three months. Proposed changes can come from every member of the committee or inside the NCCN, but also from outside the NCCN network. If you have a recommendation and question toward NCCN guidelines, there's actually a link on the website where you can submit a request to the NCCN guidelines panel, and this is available to everyone, uh, and we will actually take these recommendations or comments quite seriously. Short annotated comments that you might want to make to change NCCN guidelines. So every three months, members of NCCN institutions are solicited to bring uh, comments uh, from various disciplines to these uh, teleconferences, and we have ad hoc teleconferences and face-to-face -face meetings that can be set up as needed to address certain breakthrough events that might be presented or published uh, at conferences. I just want to highlight a little bit of a difference in recommendation levels. We have four separate categories, uh, which are category one, high-level evidence, uniform consensus that this intervention is appropriate. A lot of the recommendations are level 2A, lower-level evidence, but there is uniform, unanimous NCCN consensus that we want to include these in guidelines. Category 2B, lower level of evidence and not unanimous consensus, kind of majority vote. And level 3, they're meaning there is major disagreement whether this is appropriate, and this, of course, the lowest level of evidence. What we've tried in the last uh, edition in colon cancer versus two, uh, 2016 V2 is to include so-called so evidence blocks. And the evidence blocks are in our attempt to put a value to therapy based on efficacy, safety, quality of evidence, uh, the consistency of evidence, and the affordability on a patient level. And this is meant to be able to give uh, physicians a tool at hand, really in discussion with patients, to look at the right value, a combination of clinical benefit, costs, so really overall value. These are it's our first attempt. They are being refined as we speak. So stay tuned. Uh, they're already online, but stay tuned. There will be some refinement in terms of what you actually see in the end product. So let me point out some key strengths of NCCN guidelines from my perspective. We frequently update our guidelines. It's not a two-year process from a conference to a publication, we really up, uh, update the NCCN guidelines three to four times a year. We can uh, have ability to act to breakthrough events or react to breakthrough events. Rapid online publication with free access to the public 
Um, it's an annot the annotated treatment algorithms are really a living document that gets changed on the fly with some editing provided by the NCCN uh, staff. We have a uh, we have a large standing experience committee of various fields related to diagnosis and treatment and management of uh, colorectal cancer with input of patient advocates. We allow input from outside sources, as I just showed you. Um, and we have in our, in our consensus classification, we actually allow level of evidence in areas where phase three data are lacking. So I strongly believe that not every single clinical situation that we encounter will be covered by phase three level of evidence, and we need to have an expert consensus census to really address these holes in our data uh, to really give uh, physicians recommendations. And as I said, you know, it's a, a compendia for reimbursement in the United States. So uh, Eric pointed this out kind of based on recommendations to different panels. I'd like to focus on the management of metastatic colorectal cancer, the palliative management of uh, metastatic colorectal cancer. There's a lot of uh, kind of other uh, algorithms in the guidelines that deal with the preoperative, neoadjuvant, perioperative uh, therapy of metastatic disease, but I want to focus on the palliative, palliative treatment systemic therapy. So there are some interesting footnotes which are very much in line with what you've heard before from the ESMO guidelines. Um, uh, one thing that goes beyond, a PET CT scan should not be used to monitor response to therapy. Oxaplatin based first line therapy should be included in form of a stop and go or main, main, induction maintenance uh, strategy. Um, discontinuation of oxaplatin after three to four months should be considered. It can be reintroduced later if you hadn't had progression of disease on the therapy. Very clearly stated, um, and this is, I know, where the United States lag behind some time to the European regulations. All patients with metastatic colorectal cancer have their tissue geno, uh, uh, genotyped for RAS, KRAS, NRAS, and BRAF mutation. And it's clear that KRAS and NRAS, X1234 mutation, those patients should not be treated with cetuximab or panitumab. And it states there's increasing evidence that BRAF V600E mutations make response to EGF septa antibodies, a single agent combination with cytotoxic chemotherapy, highly unlikely. Another point is MMR or MSI testing should be performed form for all patients, regardless of age, with metastatic colorectal cancer. Then other kind of more treatment-related uh, footnotes, which I think are interesting, there are no data to suggest the activity of folfiria flibacept or folfiria ramosirumab in a patient that progressed on folfiria bevacizumab, so no crossover from the, of the VEGF antibodies. In this setting, bevacizumab is the preferred uh, anti-angenic agent based on toxicity, combination with a uh, comparator with the flibacept, and cost, the uh, comparator would be um, ramosirumab. There are no data, no, there's a compelling rational, I think this is important, to support the use of panitumumab after clinical failure on cetuximab and vice versa. And I think this is also uh, picked up in the ESMO guidelines. And single agent capsidamine after prior treatment with fluoroprimidine with progression of disease is not recommended. And the, we do not endorse the combination of capsidamine plus arenotecan due to toxicity concerns. Now, when you actually look at the uh, guidelines, and this is version 2, uh, 2016, which is online and includes these evidence blocks. And this is what you see, it kind of it's separated uh, different than the ESMO guidelines based on first-line treatment and whether patients are considered appropriate for what we call intense therapy. This is the panel for oxaplatin first-line, where you use either Folfox, Kbox, uh, Folfox plus bevacizumab, uh, or the uh, Folfox plus egf antibody uh, uh, therapies. And then based on first-line treatment, you go through an arenotecan-based regimen and then later to later lines of treatment. So I want to highlight some of the aspects here. First of all, the definition appropriate for intense therapy is not defined. This is in the eye of the physician, in the eye of the beholder. Secondly, Folfox is recommended in combination with Cetuximab or panitumab as first-line therapy in RAS and, as you heard, BRAF wild-type tumors. Then, um, in a second-line setting, you might appreciate that there is a renotique and bevacizumab option which is, has, is listed, although you probably all know that there's never been a renotique and bevacizumab or renotique and flibacept arm, uh, all the uh, treatment uh, arm in phase three studies, all these uh, data um, have been generated with the Folfiri combination, um, but this is where we allow for uh, regimens without clear phase three um, evidence based on the consensus statement. 
for the salvage therapy option, regorafi versus uh, tipiracil and trifluoridin, or TAS-102, there is not a preferred uh, sequence outlined for regorafenib or TAS-102. Now, if you have a renotique in first-line uh, based therapy, first of all, you might notice there is no capecitin renotique, and as I mentioned, and I, there's also a footnote which I should have uh, put in here that capecitin should not be combined with an egf septa antibody based on some negative results, in particular in the COIN study, for instance. But otherwise, again, you sequence patients through the different uh, treatment approaches, um, and in a salvage therapy setting, even in a renotique and pretreated patient population, you can use renotique, and again, in combination with an egf septic antibody in RAS and, uh, as you heard, BRAF type tumors, um, or egf septic antibodies, either cetuximab or panitumab, can be considered a single agent. Now, the next, um, uh, the other, the next panel looks at other first-line regimens, and this is probably one of the weaker parts, and I'm happy to criticize NCCN guidelines. Uh, patients appropriate for intense therapy on this panel, they include anything from fluoroprimidine plus bevacizumab to folfox erie plus bevacizumab, with, of course, consequences for the, um, uh, the treatment approach, depending on how many uh, 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 agents you use in first-line therapy. Um, we do not have a clear statement that triplet chemotherapy is the preferred regimen yet for BRAF mutant tumors. And then for patients not considered appropriate for intense therapy, which is similar to the unfit category for in, in the ESMO guidelines, um, there is some, uh, there, it's kind of a potpourri of uh, inclusion of uh, treatment regimens that are included here, including uh, regimens like cetuximab and tumab single agent. As you know, we don't have good evidence for that this really improves outcome for patients. That's a consensus based uh, recommendation. So the weaknesses that I see, and again, I'm happy to talk about weaknesses here. Um, some of the regimens with level 2A recommendation really have very little or no supporting clinical data. I highlighted the arenotique and bevacizumab second-line therapy. Again, uh, these recommendations are based on a consensus. Is this being used in our NCC and member institutions? Um, I also believe that there are too few preferred choices. Uh, it's kind of a potpourri of options are included, and there is a lack of guidance. And I do believe when we talk about guidelines, physicians really look to, for guidance based on expert consensus. Uh, so this is probably a lacking feature of several of these guidelines, particularly NCCN guidelines. What I believe is a strength of the ESMO guidelines over the NCCN guidelines is that the initial treatment selection really is defined by goal of therapy. I would like to include this in the NCCN guidelines. Again, this is a consensus prog uh, a process, and it would lead to a major restructuring of the NCCN guidelines, probably not in the next couple of uh, iteration that we'll see. We have not included the palliative setting and kind of a mandatory assessment for resectability for patients that have great response. This should, of course, be it's mentioned in the text, but not in the algorithm. Maintenance therapy, again, is not part of the flow algorithm, but in the supporting text. So what's going to happen very soon, as you heard, we update the NCCN guidelines quite frequently. We have a face-to-face -face meeting on August 1st in Philadelphia where we talk about things like the role of sightedness, for instance, for air treatment selection, a big topic, of course, that came out of the recent uh, presentations. Immunotherapy, can we already make recommendations for immunotherapy? A lot of patients in the United States are already receiving commercial drug and paid by the insurance for MSI high tubers, in the, even in a first-line setting, colorectal cancer, which is a problem for the conduct of clinical trials sometimes. What about the role of HER2 testing? And we see a refinement of the evaluation blocks. Now, to conclude, I think the NCCN guidelines, with all their shortcomings and weaknesses that I pointed out, do provide a very comprehensive set of recommendations for diagnosis, treatment, surveillance of colorectal cancer. The frequent updates that we have, which is the unique feature of NCCN guidelines, really provide up-to-date information. The, the, the recommendations are publicly and free available um, so I believe they are used quite uh, frequently in, in uh, widespread around the world. The consensus model allows for recommendation areas where we have lack of evidence, which comes as a price of a re reduced level of evidence against a consensus statement. And I do admit that the role that NCCN guidelines play in their 
uh, help to reimburse certain treatment approaches really drives part of the recommendations that is quite naturally. I do believe that the value assessment uh, that is being performed, the evaluation blocks, could be a very valuable tool complementing the ASCO and ESMO approaches, uh, and we, every single treatment approach will, assign, will have an evidence block assigned to it. This is currently being developed and we hopefully be helpful for your clinical practice. Thank you very much.